Well, hello everybody. Um, we're back again for the Fighter Tales podcast. With me today is Jordan. Well, Jordan, why don't you go ahead and say hello? Hey guys, how you doing? Today we're talking about the F5. Not just the F5 Tiger II, but the Freedom Fighter and a few other things involved with it. And uh, we've got Jordan here who uh, knows a lot about the F5, so this is going to be pretty interesting, I think. So, um, Jordan, why don't you tell me what exactly the F5 is? Yeah, so the F5, both the Freedom Fighter and the Tiger II, um, is a light, what was a lightweight fighter that was capable of doing not just like air to air, but also some air to ground and reconnaissance missions as well. So it was a really flexible, really versatile airplane. Um, and in a way, you can kind of think of it as like the F16, 15 years before the F16 hit the line. So. Yeah, from my understanding, the whole idea of the F-5 is that it was made for, well, after it was fully developed, it was made to be exported to other countries that didn't have the infrastructure to maintain something like an F-4 or an F-100 Super Saber. Um, just countries that were friendly to the U.S., that needed a fighter, and um, could operate it in pretty rough conditions compared to what we usually have. Right. Yeah, in a lot of ways, it's interesting because... It, had we adopted the F5 on mass, um, in conjunction with the Phantom, then we could have had this whole p paradigm of the high low mix. You know, a decade, almost a decade and a half before we actually did right with the F15 and the F16. But um, a lot of countries, including South Korea and Iran, um, operated a high low mix of F5s and F4s way before the concept of of such a doctrine actually like came to light. So that's pretty interesting. Yeah, it's a really interesting thing to bring up, honestly, because um, we do talk about the high-low mix as, like, a very modern concept, um, where now right. now for, like, the Navy, we have, um, you know, the F-18 Super Hornet and the F-35, and we've got, for the Air Force, like, the uh, F-15 Eagle and the F-16 operating con in a conjunction. But, um, you know, that concept actually goes back a long way. We just didn't know what to call it at the time. Right, and it's it's kind of interesting, like, doctrinally if we had adopted so because we were because the air force was you know still in its mindset of big expensive missile slinging fighters at the time of the f4 and the early days of the f15 we we didn't really uh we were kind of blind to the capabilities of the f, f uh, of the f5 right um like a lot of the f5's success especially like earlier in vietnam i'll talk we'll, we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail later but um a lot of it was even in some ways suppressed right because we didn't want congress or we didn't want um other countries or you know the the powers that be see this whole situation and be like well if the f5 is actually so capable of doing all these things why are we investing so much in big expensive airplanes if this little airplane is just as good if not better right so there's there's some politics that would yeah, yeah, and, and that, that's the real rub, too, because the F-5, you know, while it is good up close in a dogfight, doesn't have the capabilities that, like, say, an F-4 would have for long-range engagements or uh, going after bombers and whatnot. So, you know, you, you really do need kind of that balance in an Air Force. But for just exporting to other countries, you know, something like the Freedom Fighter would be a great option. You know, it's relatively cheap, um, reliable, um, pretty much has most of the hallmarks that you would see in Soviet aircraft. Yeah, so that's interesting um, that you bring that up because, like, the reason why we use it as an aggressor is because at the time the percentage threat was the MiG twenty one, right? It was was the fish bed, and in a lot of ways the F five is similar to a fish bed. It looks like a fish bed, you know, from the frontal silhouette. Um, so like the visual cross section is very similar, and the op the theory of operations like being able to operate from less prepared fields um being easy to maintain right like all of this was super um well thought out when they when when they they developed it as a matter of fact the guy who developed it was an engineer named edgar schmood he's basically like everyone's favorite aerospace engineer that you don't think about um and i say this because like if you ask somebody like hey who's your favorite aerospace engineer you know most of the time they'll say something like kelly johnson right, because P P-38, Skunk Works, all that shit, if they're like a fucking edgelord, they'll be like, oh, Willie Messerschmitt, or oh, Kurt Tank. Oh, God. You know? <laughs> um, 
But like, what's interesting is that when you name, when you ask someone like, "What's your favorite airplane?" You know, you'll hear a lot of people saying like P fifty one Mustang or like B B twenty five Mitchell, right? But then if you ask them like, "Do you know who designed those airplanes?" Most people don't really know who Edgar Schmude was. Yeah. And um, so you know, he was he was a, a German American, you know, who who worked for North American during World War II, designed the Mustang, the AT six Texan, the uh, the the Yale well, that came before the Texan, the B-25, lots of other airplanes. Um, he came to North after the war, and uh, he designed the F-5 to actually be able to be built and maintained with technology that wasn't, like, too far different from the construction and maintenance, like, field operations that you would need to maintain a World War II airplane. So, especially coming off of World War II, like, all this, you know, like, as we were moving into the jet age, maintaining an F-5 wasn't all that much different than maintaining an f-86 which was a big deal um at a time when things like lru's and shit were becoming more available and standard on things like the f4 so the f5 was a really good medium yeah and it still had some advanced capabilities i mean the freedom fighter the initial release of it didn't um have any radar in it as far as i know but eventually there were versions that had you know like a, a decent little it wasn't even like a uh search radar is more like a like a tracking radar but you know you had some modern amenities that you know you'd see in an f4 a good ejection seat um you know hydraulically boosted controls that kind of stuff but in mm -hmm. a package that was still really easy to maintain and operate right and that's that's why the early the early f5 is the f5a and the b got the name the freedom fighter right because it was able to be marketed and spread uh pro proliferated you know all throughout these I guess, like, developing countries um, to basically export freedom, right? In the same way that the Soviets were exporting the opposite of freedom in, in, the, <laughs> in the form of the Mickey and Gurevich MiG-21. Um, so the F-5 was supposed to be the geopolitical counter to that. Yeah, and we didn't even really know it at the time, too, because the MiG-21 was such a mystery to us when the F-5 was made. <laughs> Right. <laughs> we like both the Americans and Soviets were doing the same thing. The only difference is that the Soviets adopted the MiG twenty one in full and we didn't. Right. Can you imagine? <clears throat> I mean, we'd have the high low mix. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because if you think about it, the Soviets really didn't have anything that was considered the, the high in the high mix or in the high low mix. Um you know, they, they had the MiG twenty one and they had interceptors like the SU fifteen. And I guess that's kind of the same thing, but the SU-15 wasn't proliferated as much as the uh, F-4 was. And even the F-4, the F-4 was exported like, oh my god, it was exported like a motherfucker. It was sent all over the world, just like the F-5 yeah, was. I, yeah, I mean, and especially, oh man, like, you know, like, the feeling when you get, like, the new iPhone, or what you think is, like, the new iPhone, and then, like, the, the next year they came out with the new one? Mm-hmm. Like... How do you think all those? Because you know most F4 operators didn't op, didn't adopt them in the sixties, right? They would they adopted them like after Vietnam, like you know, early, like early mid seventies, right? Like yeah. kind of. So and then like five five years later, the F15 comes out. Like, how do you think that made all those F4 operators? Feel? <laughs> and the F15 was pretty well uh, exported too. So <laughs> yeah, we're actually better exporters than people give us credit for a lot of people think like oh the soviet union's great because they supply any country with any fighter jet they want we do the same right. thing right like just look at the yeah. f-35 now there are way more f-35s in circulation than there are i think even the mig-29s i'm pretty sure they got the unit cost for the f-35 like really low now yeah i don't, um, I don't know the exact number for it but I, I last i checked they were less than a block three super hornet which wow. was what hurt that program a lot yeah, because the Block 3 um, Super Hornet had to make some cuts. They had to cut the conformal fuel tanks and everything. And Well, yeah. I mean, Boeing was in some deep water for a minute. You know, like, between nobody buying F-18s yeah. and the whole 737 Max uh, fiasco. Oh, fiasco, yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, And the KC-46, the Air Force stopped accepting deliveries on those because of QAQC issues. Like... This is going to be kind of, kind, of, kind of a controversial subject, but I, I think I'll say this and I'll stand by it. As someone who worked on the the T fifty at Lockheed Martin, um, the the Boeing TX, in my opinion, was like the the T seven A Red Hawk. Don't get me wrong; I think it's a great great looking airplane and looks I think it looks sick. It's gonna be built at Purdue, um, 
in Lafayette, Indiana, which is which is a, a sweet little school with a cool airport. But like that contract, I feel like that was awarded to them because they needed a bone. You know, like if, if they hadn't won that one, they would be in some deep doo doo. Yeah, I mean, they seem to be bouncing back a little bit with the F fifteen EX program, but yeah, for a while there, I mean, it was kind of one of those situations where they. Well, north of Grumman, they found themselves in a similar situation when the uh, YF-23 was not built in favor of the F-22. Like, they... Right. Because it, it wasn't a matter of them, like, having any, like, severe fuck-ups like Boeing did, but there was just a period where Lockheed was getting all of the bids, and they were like, uh, well, we'll give you the B-2. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you've heard the story, right, of how, like, the YF-23 was, like, pitched by a bunch of nerds. And, like, so they were talking about how good the capabilities were and with, like, spreadsheets and do documents and stuff like that during their presentation at the fly-off. And then uh, Lockheed had, like, the Elon Musk, like, SpaceX presentation. Oh, no. Years. You know, so... So that's like, where all that badass footage of the YF-22 comes from. <laughs> you, yeah, now you know. <laughs> yeah, because like, you never how, see like, that. Like, I'm, I, all I could... Because, like, it's funny because whenever... Like, are you familiar with the Western Museum of Flights, like, YouTube channel? I'm not, but uh, I'd okay, love to so, check it out. Okay, uh, so your, your viewers might be familiar with this, but there's so much good information on the Western Museum of Flights YouTube channel with um about the YF-23, and so much of it is, like, hosted at the senior folks' home. It's really funny. <laughs> actually, actually, this this might actually be that old folk, like, that assisted living houses. Oh, no. Channel, but, like, like there's so much good information on the Black Widow 2. And it's, it's, it's hilarious because the way it's presented, like, my, my, my headcanon is that it was presented the exact same way back in 1991. <laughs> my god, I can see it now, because you don't see a lot of cool footage of the YF-23, but you see a shit ton of the YF-22. Right. Oh, yeah, I, I'm and, just imagining. And, um, it's almost like they, they made that badass car, car commercial for the F-20. This is the F-20 Tiger Shark. America's newest tactical fighter. And then they like, they're like, all right, we got to dial it back. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. They yeah, dialed yeah, it yeah. back like too much. Yeah, because the the, the uh, F twenty, which we'll get to later, had a great marketing program. Like Chuck Yeager was oh, involved. Fuck, yeah, dude, that video is badass. Um, uh, God, who's who? This guy's name. Um, I follow him on Instagram. But the photographer, the main, like, director and videographer of the, the F-20 commercial, Jeff Zwart, um, he was, he, yeah, his, his Instagram handle is Zwart, Z-W-A-R-T. Mm -hmm. um, he worked for Northrop, you know, um, on all those ads. And it was really funny because the, that gray F-20 is actually painted in automotive paint. Um, really? The shade, yeah, it's, it's a, it's like a, I think it's like a Mercedes or a I had no idea whatsoever because you know now that I think about it though it really doesn't look like aircraft paint. Right. Yeah. It's it's interesting because like because like they really wanted that airplane to evoke like sports car you know, um, hmm. and that's that's kind of how that came from. I mean, hell, it uh, kind of was a sports car. It was. It was. Uh, all right. I, so I just found it on a scale modeling form. It was painted at a BMW North America car car color. It's a dark metallic gray. That's really neat. I, had, <laughs> I I wonder how that would hold up to high speeds. Yeah, it was the color was known as anth anth anthracite anthracite gray. Hmm. Well, let's yep. rewind the tape a little bit because we will get to the F twenty here pretty soon, and yeah, I definitely want to talk more about it um, and what its capabilities were. But we have to cover what the capabilities of the Freedom Fighter and the Tiger two were. And You're absolutely right. So so it's funny, right? So, um, so two right Ti Tiger two. Yeah. Like what what the fuck is the F5 the sequel to, right? Mm -hmm. Um there is a tiger. That's the the Grumman F11F, you know, in the the big cat naming convention. But that's actually not the tiger that the 2 and Tiger 2 refers to. Just to make things more confusing because the the 2 refers to an airplane that was only known by the name Tiger in a project name. And uh that's that's the Goshi Tiger. Um which was supposed to be Sukoshi, which is Japanese for for small, you know, like small small tiger, but you know, it's the the sixties, and you're essentially trying to be like Mad Men, but in the the Pentagon. So 
you 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 fuck it up and call it the Scotia Tiger. Right, right. Uh, <laughs> as you do. <laughs> as you do. Yeah. Um, so twelve of these F five A's were modified basically with 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 refueling probes and more uh, hard points, um, and they were redesignated the F five C by the Air Force. And the F five C, if you look up in a uh, uh, photographs, typically they're carrying the wingtip tanks, the area ruled. I think it's like a fifty gallon tank. You um, know, we should probably explain what area ruling is. Oh yeah, because that's like a big thing. With that's F5 a big deal with the F five. Yeah. All, so all, all um. We can yeah. circle back to that. Oh, uh, I'll edit a. F- I'll send you a photo of me walking on top of an F five at work. Okay, yeah, that works. Um, and I'll point but it out. Like, I, like it's the whole like it's like the area roll section of the fuselage, and that's like the worst part to walk on because there's a no, no step zone like just outboard on the wing, so you can't actually walk on the wing. So you have to like, <laughs> so you have to like, like, um, basically, tightrope your way, like on the area roll section, and then try not to fall, like try not to step on the no step section, like at the intake lip. Oh, so the no step so, section is that like little decal you see on a five model kits. It's like the little trapezoid. Correct. Yep. Okay. So like right, like right next to the uh, the area world section. Yeah, I've 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 a great like I I wear like what like size ten ten and a half shoes and like yeah. I ha- I have a lot of trouble walking on that airplane. Oh my dude, if I were trying to walk on it, I've got size thirteens. I would like fall. Oh, and you shit. would not. You you would just yeah no. You <laughs> you wouldn't be allowed. <laughs> I'd be like straddling the spine of it as I'm walking past it. Yeah, <laughs> only on Falcons podcast, guys. Well, you have, like, conversations about how difficult it is to walk on certain aircraft. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you know it's real. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, um, the F-5 has notoriously short legs. It still does. Um, but it at that point, it, you know, because especially, like, I want to say a quarter of all the photos you see of American aircraft in Vietnam were of them are fueling. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so, <laughs> so like that kind of tells you how like why that had to happen right because you're taking off from laos or fucking um Th- 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 thailand that one base in thailand that i really should know the name of but it's it's, it's it's yeah sure yeah that one um <laughs> and they're all like taking off from thailand or sort of like south korea uh, trying to get to the to these bases or like targets in north korea right so the f5 had a had a refuel like oftentimes multiple refuels per mission right um and so it was mostly used as a fighter bomber. Um, most of like m- most of the main ordnance that the Air Force fielded, it was able to to carry. So like the Mark 82, the, the 500 pounders, the 750 pound M117s, it could carry napalm and uh, and and rocket pods. And um, so the whole reason of this whole test was because they wanted to like. The whole reason of Project Scotia Tiger was they wanted to to prove that this airplane was a good airplane, right? Because the United States wasn't adopting them, and but but yet we we're trying to peddle these to other countries. So if we're not flying them ourselves, then why would they want to fly it, right? Yeah, it was like a trial, you know, almost sort of it, like an advertising was, thing. It's like you know, hey, we was, were able to do this exactly. shit in Vietnam. Yeah, it was like um, like you know how the for, the the first tra- Transformers movie. Like sold the like AFSOC and A10s and like yeah yeah E3s to the American pu- public, <laughs> like like Project Scotty Tiger was was tra- Transformers one to the free world, <laughs> you know like, the, like every, every night you're watching on TV what the Americans are doing in Southeast Asia and you're seeing all these little t- tiny airplanes with trapezoidal wings like kick ass and you're like fuck yeah I want those oh oh what do you mean I, c- I can have them for like the price of a McChicken fuck yeah I'll, I'll take that <laughs> I'll, I'll take three I'll take thirty. Right, so like a lot of these countries were flying like like first and second generation bom- like you know planes, and the 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 biggest contemporary in terms of the fighter bomber role to the F five A was actually the F one hundred Super Saber. Yes, and the F five was really maneuverable, which made it more survivable than the F one hundred. It could it, it was able to d- deliver as much payload with uh, with as much accuracy as F one hundred, you know. So it it was able to do this job better than the super saber in theater with higher survivability rates and greater bringing back cap- cap- capability um and as a matter of fact like the f5c and the earlier like when the fivu started to, to see service very very late in the war um and also the a7 corsair 2 were like some of the lowest loss rates in terms of like aircraft in vietnam did any of the scotchy tigers ever get shot down really because i don't think they did I think I, I'm, like I'm South sure Vietnam. 
South Vietnamese ones, I know, like, you know, they suffered some losses, but I don't know if the initial Air the, Force the ones... Initial, the, initial, the initial 12? Yeah, let me look that up. We'll, we'll go to intermission here for a second. I'm going to look this one up. Hmm. We'll circle yeah, back. They, they lost a lot of them, but, um, you know, yeah. still, like, they... The F five, it, 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 like compared to like the one hundred five or the F one hundred, like shit did pretty pretty it, well. It did well, yeah, especially for only twelve of them. Twelve aircraft, yeah. twenty six hundred sorties. That's astronomical. That's insane. Yeah, it's it's actually like phenomenal. Yeah. Um, um, in addition, I'm seeing that uh, they also added ninety pounds of uh, external armor plating under the cockpit and engine. That that makes sense. So like performance reducing things. I mean, they were effectively ground attack fighters for the scope of Vietnam. Um, so I've heard, and I don't know if I trust this, but I've heard it from people that were there, um, that there were disputed claims when they were in, in country with the 45th, uh, the, the, the 45th 03rd. So like, that's like the, like after Project Scot Scotia Tiger, um, so the, the 45th 03rd was a, a provisional tactical fighter squadron. That was like the squadron that they made. Yeah, um, like to to test the these things, but he was like a like like a maintainer in that squadron, and he claimed that the F five actually got a couple kills over over Mig nineteens and Mig huh. or whatever, like gun kills in Vietnam. That's... I don't know if I trust that, I... but at the same time, like if it was swept under the rug, I wouldn't like I wouldn't be surprised either. Yeah, I mean, especially if they pursued him over like Laos or Cambodia or something. Right, and well, and and also, like we said earlier, you know, they're 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 not trying to push this airplane's air to air abilities because that would hurt, you know, procurement of more Phantoms, right? <laughs> That's true. Or, yes, or yeah. bigger, expensive airplanes. Because remember, this is like pseudo, like 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 proto re reformers era U.S. Air Force. Oh yeah, you yeah. Know? <laughs> well, yeah. You also had Robert McNamara running the show too. So like, exactly. if he if he got so much as a fucking hint. Of the F5's capabilities, he would have been like, fuck the F4, we're going F5s. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, um, there, there were, a, there's a lot of, a lot of that, like, going on. Enough so that if the F5 had scored air to air victories over Vietnam, I almost, I, like, I'm not, I'm not saying I believe it, but I wouldn't be surprised. If, yeah, if yeah. That, was that how makes that sense. That whole thing transpired. Yeah. I don't know of any. Well, okay, so no, no, actually, I, the F five did score air to air kills in the Iran Iraq War. That's a definite, right? Um, but I don't know. It if also any... had some probables in in Yemen, which we'll talk about later. Oh yes, yes, it did. Uh, but I don't know of any officially one hundred percent confirmed American operated kills. Right. If it happened, very cool. It yeah, might they're... have. It's all speculation. I knew. I knew they um, like androgynous random uh like unnamed foreign countries shot down a to tomcat in 86 with f5s wait what are you talking like wait yeah f5 oh 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 yeah yeah no i know wow. <laughs> okay first off no that was not an f5 it was a mig-28 <laughs> completely different airframe it has a lot yeah. of very it has a lot of similarities um but it can't the, the do a negative similar, pushover. But, but but the negative but the inverter tanks yeah you know yeah. The, the the inverter tanks can't handle a negative g pushover it also bleeds a lot more speed under 300 knots than the f5 <laughs> can you imagine if something bled more speed than the f5 <laughs> under 300 knots <laughs> like when i'm under 300 knots in an f5 i feel like i'm gonna fall out the sky yeah <laughs> i can only imagine dude like the thing is meant to go fast yeah. <laughs> like, you look at the thing, it, it looks like a fucking sports car. Yeah, it's sweet. I love the F5. Like, I'm gonna go on record right now and say the F5 is one of my favorite aircraft. It's, um... it. I'm gonna... And it, it's funny, because, like, now it pays the bills for me, but it wasn't always that way for me. You know? Really? Like, I, I had to come to... Like, I had to learn to respect this airplane over time. You had to come um, to Jesus moment. But, yeah. But, like, now, now that, like obviously looking at it now it's like it is a it's, it's an amazing airplane especially in the context of its time period and you know the effects that it had on aircraft design and um like how we use fighters like can like that, that can't be overstated 
Yeah. It was basically like the turning point of like fighter doctrine in a lot of ways. Yeah, and and a cool thing about the F5 is that it could be like even produced in other countries like Canada. Right. Like so, yeah, so so like the F5A and the F5B Canada Air made them um as a CF116 and the CF116 or CF116A and the CF116D. Um and they also built the NF5s for Norway. I didn't know that actually. Yeah, so the NF5A and the Nor- NF5B were were made for Norway. Um, Casa in Spain, they actually made F5As and Bs too. And both Taiwan, the Republic of China, and uh, South Korea also like produced um, indigenously. Like they, they assembled their own F5Es. Hmm. Uh, both, yeah. South, both South Korea and Taiwan also flew F5As and Bs. Like they also adopted those um, after Project Sc- Scotia Tiger. Um, but Taiwan, they gave, like, half their F5As and Bs to South Vietnam, like, during the Vietnam War. Yeah. And they got they got them replaced by uh, F5As, so. You know, interestingly enough, um, we exported F5As and Bs to Iran in the 60s, and as they were upgrading to F5As and Fs, they were giving their F5As and Bs to, um, you know, other countries as well. Oh, really? <laughs> they, they exported to South Vietnam, dude. Oh, well, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, the the F five A like the F five, um, in yeah, I've I, I had a friend describe them as like the Mazda Miata of fighter planes. Yeah, like they're they're just they're they're little they're they're sporty, uh, they're really capable. You know, it's like Toyota Corolla, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and it's they're pretty pretty sweet. And you can modify the shit out of them pretty easily. <laughs> yeah, there's so many variants, sub variants. Um, Spud, a coworker of mine. He actually was one of the cadre in our company to fly. So, 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 so this is pu- pu- is public knowledge. He was one of the groups of one of the the Americans to to go, um, to, to go to Ukraine and fly the SU twenty seven. Oh, and this wow. guy was a F fourteen and F four pilot. He also flies uh, fly slash flew F fives for our company. Huh. Um, but anyway, like he was like back in the day when when when, when he was all flying with the Navy. And he was checking out those Brazilian or Chilean, one of these South American countries, F5s on their ramp. And, like, they had Python 4s. What the fuck? Yeah. It was it was kind of crazy. Like, he swears that he saw Py- Python 4s, like, on these airplanes. And it's funny because, like, he went in and he was like, wow, um, you guys have Python 4s on these? And the guys, like, the, the, the base commander or, like, the squadron commander, CO... He he winked at him. I was like Python three. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's so amazing. The, the, the Israelis were doing a lot of uh, a lot of upgrades for F fives as well. The Israelis actually do a lot of aircraft upgrades that people don't really know about. For other they countries. they have a very very good aircraft like avionics industry. Right. You know, and like just because they don't make their own indigenous fighter it doesn't mean that they don't have a good aerospace industry you know like in terms of uh, systems integration in terms of like avionics they're they're pretty pretty badass oh yeah yeah um ironically enough though we never sold that five is uh, Israel as far as I know yeah it might have been to the point when they were kind of in in hot water Maybe. I mean, I know we sold them <laughs> F4s, A4s, pretty much everything but the F5, and they ended up with F16s eventually, so I guess they just never needed them? Oh. Yeah, it's po- possible. But I, I don't know. Um, I think that would be an interesting research yeah, topic. Yeah, figure out, like, why the Israelis didn't figure out. If anyone in the comments section knows, like, why the Israelis never adopted the F5, go ahead and, t- and, and tell us. I, I will I'm, say... I'm curious. I will say the F twenty was a competitor to the, to the um, lobby. Oh yes, um, yeah. that's that's a whole other box of worms. Uh, Kurnos, if you're listening, this is a shout out to you. Apparently, Israel <laughs> had a, a program like a like a VFX program or whatever, um, where the F sixteen, the lobby, and the F twenty were all competing, and that's, that's where the lobby came from. Okay, and then and then the lobby lost and become the Chengdu J ten. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Shit. I'm not kidding. I'm I I am kidding. You, you can't tell if I'm kidding or not. Yeah, that's the fun part. That's the fun part about this podcast. Whenever Jordan kids about something you don't know, you have no idea if it's the truth or if he's just trying to pull your leg or Yeah. Yeah, so anyway, the two in Ti- Tiger 2 
right? Is <laughs> that's a reference to Scotia Tiger. So, yeah. but like they 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 didn't want to call it the Scotia Tiger two because they're like eventually down the line someone's gonna be like, what the fuck is a Scotia? Right. <laughs> um. So, they uh, Northrop. They do want to still capitalize on the success of their their little tiger, and they called the airplane the ti- Tiger Two. So that's that's where that name came. The from. Tiger Two is cool because it had it had uh, RWR installed. It had a proper radar installed, even though it wasn't the best thing ever. Um, APQ one fifty one fifty three. Yeah, something like that. Like the original one had a ranging radar for the gun sight, but it didn't have like a mm-hmm. proper like tracking radar. And even then, the tracking radar is something you kind of use to just guide, you know, a good vector for your sidewinders and shit. Um, right. But otherwise, I mean. You know, the, it was still kind of, it was still an export fighter. Um, I think it had an approved ejection seat too. I think it had a Martin Baker installed. I don't yeah. know. You, you tell still me. Had the, still had the Northrop seat. Really? Yeah. Like actually, so the Navy, the the Navy, the current F five Ns had the Martin Baker seat. That was part of their very poorly documented F five N project in the early two thousands. It's the bane bane of bane of my existence. If I'm gonna be honest, so much of my shit is like trying to redocument the navy's work hey like if, if any of any of our listeners are from N- nav air like I, I i love you guys appreciate your work but but good lord you know the lack of documentation on the f5n mod is is kicking my ass right now is it one of those things where it's like no two f5ns are completely the same like the f14 more or less you know if you look at pictures of f5ns sometimes you'll see the apx 119 iff and antennas like in the center tool and kind uh the center tool cooling tunnel panels for the windscreen sometimes they're missing um, the the uh VHF antenna the Swiss installed on the spine, the, I guess like the tur- turtle back of the airplane. Like we tore them off and put a GPS puck there instead, and then now hmm. they want us to put a VHF antenna back on there. You know, it's, it, there's all sorts of funny stuff going on with this pro- project. Um, but the F5N, yeah, it's 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 it was an artisan airplane for sure, because like all the modification was done by uh, Navy and Northrop, and I guess part partially Swiss um, back then when we were re-importing them. Yeah, because they were all re-imported from different countries that had different shit put on them, so I bet that puts a nail in things. Yeah, it's 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 cool, though. You know, it's, yeah, uh, yeah. it keeps keeps things interesting. Like, I walk into work, and at first glance, it's like, oh, there's six F5s in this hangar, but among those six F5s, like, there's like five different airplanes. You know, it's, right. it, it's really interesting. Are there any like legacy, um, like freedom fighter parts that somehow come up in, you know, replacements or anything? Like, are you able to put any freedom fighter parts on the, uh, the new? I shit? believe the horizontal stabilizers are the same. Okay, not much um, else. Though. They're pretty much different planes for the most part. Yeah, I- I'm trying to think of the tip cap on the vertical stabilizer. No, it's not interchangeable. Um, but yeah, the vertical stabilizer, the vertical stabilizer is basically it. The canopy is very similar, like the actual canopy for the single seater for the FIV, right? Um, is pretty similar. Also, just to clear things up for our listeners, um, the F5A was a single seater, the F5B was a two seater, and the F5E mm-hmm. was a single seater, and the F5F is the two seater. Yep. Not to be yep. confused with the T38, which also gets really complicated if you want to like start talking about north or airframes, but that's yeah. Like I know because the T38 is. I mean, it's still a pretty common airplane. It's our, like, the Air Force's main primary trainer. Sorry, advanced trainer. Um, it's still pretty common. There's a lot of, like, a lot of times people mistake the F5F for the T-38. And if, like, you know, I always have to resist the urge to, like, push on my glasses and be like, no, it's two different airplanes. But you Actually. Know, like, it, it's, uh, the, the T- T-38 does bear a lot of similarities to the F5B. I will say that. Yes. Yeah, I mean, um, it doesn't have the lurkses, though, right? It doesn't have a Lurkses, and if you look on, like, the way that the gear and the fuselage is set up is also very different. But, like, the M156T, but, like, they're both M156 der- derivatives, right? So, the the North 156F was, F stands for fighter, that became the F5A, and NF- N- N156T, T for trainer, became the T38. Um, so, since they both kind of branched off from the same, like, project and Northrop, um... The, the Freedom Fighter is more similar to, to the Talon. Yeah. I don't even think the T-38s have any form of glass cockpits yet or anything. I think they're just still... 
They are. They uh, they're still old steam gauges. Uh, T forty fives also old steam gauges. You know. Um, I mean, it's good to build up the fundamentals and stuff. Yeah, but also like, you're gonna you're gonna step into like an F thirty five or like a Raptor, or a Block three Super Hornet with with a glass cockpit. Yeah. You know, like, um, there's talks of us having to do the upgrades. May, maybe for the T T thirty eight and T forty five fleet. Oh, nice! If um the T X is delayed any more than it already is, um, in which case that'll be kind of funny and interesting to do. At the same time, it'll also be kind of like annoying because we just got out of the F the C F five D business, where we're we're trying to sell all the C F five Ds. Hey, if you're interested in buying a C F five D, hit up hit us up. Um, are they just like not useful for you guys anymore? We we can't really monetize them. We use them in the past for like uh, JSOC and like JTAC training. So like they would drop the the BDU bomblets from the oh, yeah. center the the SEU two thirty. No, that's a gun pod. Fuck, uh, whatever that I, like I, big dispenser is that has the four zoonies. I know what you're like, talking about the bomblet things. Yeah, I'm 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 looking at a seventy second scale one on my desk right now. But um, and you know honestly <laughs> for the CF five D, you know just get into the civilian market at this point, man. I, I I had this daydream of giving it the forward econoline treatment and painting over the rear cockpit. Okay, hear me out. Okay. Because the problem the pro- problem here was that there wasn't enough space to put things like 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 it was hard to upgrade the airplane and give it all the AT stuff because it was a physically smaller airframe, right? Mm-hmm. But if we convert the rear seat into an avionics bay, like tear the seat out there, tear tear the the instruments out of there. Just like make it an avionics bay. Fuck, a Draken did it with the L one five nine Alcos. Like, like the the Draken L one five nines that were spotted over Nellis shortly before they were kicked out of there, um, had like the the rear fuselage was the rear cockpit was paint, painted over, hmm. um, and it, it, these things were sweet. So like I'm sure they figured out how to wait because avionics get really hot. Sure. Okay. So like an avionics bay, they're always like covered in cooling fan like you think your C- cpu you think your gaming pc has a sick cooling system <laughs> look at the avionics bay of the fighter right um so like they're typically really hot so they need to be cooled they need to be climate controlled so that's the issue like climate like adding that form of climate control to like a rear cockpit would be really difficult um especially because it's so big and so yeah the, and like the glass and everything so anyway um it's not something that we ever seriously considered, but I have day- daydreamed about about doing that, you know. I mean, it could also just act as a, like, advertising tool, too. Like, you know, just take reporters up and shit in the backseat and... Oh, yeah. Just drum up some public support. You know, that, that might not be, not be a bad idea. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, um... Yes. Anyway, CF5s are cool. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. We might have to cut some of that out for your, you know, your work, but I, I don't know. Unless you're cool with me leaving it in. Yeah, it's fine. Okay, cool. Uh, all this is pub, pub is public knowledge. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. So, we have this badass little sports car of a fighter plane, um, exported to all parts of the world, and we have an enemy who was able to get a hold of one of them at the end of Vietnam. What did they think of it? Of they, were, they got a hold of a few. Yeah, yeah. So what What did they think? I mean, this thing sounds too fucking good to, like, be true, but apparently they were pretty, uh, pretty scared of it. They were. Um, so... It was interesting because it was a like it was a it was a twin engine airplane, right? It was about the size of a MiG twenty one. Um, but they knew that it wasn't the most modern airplane ever, and they were they they'd always been told that it was inferior to the MiG twenty to to the uh, the the fish bed. Um. And like when, I I don't remember exactly like where where i read this but there is a there, there are soviet re- reports that you can read about this airplane like when they flew the f5 um and I remember, I remember reading about how they were really amused at the hydro the the, the hydraulic lifting of the nose gear okay they, were, they, they they looked at that and they were like hi oh, it's a silly like do you really need this is, is this just like 
a form of American, like, excess, Overcomplication. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Overcomplication. <laughs> but then it turns out it actually, like, lowers the takeoff roll by, what, 500 feet, something like that? E- yeah, right. But, like, like that's something that, to the Russians, like, that, that's, like, a big airplane thing. That's, like, a heavy bomber thing. I think, like, maybe yeah. the Tu-16 has it, you know? Um but like to see it like on a little fighter the size of a MiG twenty one is is it's pretty amusing, right? Yeah. So um yeah so they 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 flew them against MiG twenty ones they flew them against MiG twenty threes, and like in close quarters like an air like an ACM and B- BFM, um even though the MiG twenty one had a higher thrust to weight ratio the MiG twenty one like almost like always lost. So it had higher the F five had better no- nose authority. Um, than both the the flogger and the fish bed, um, and it was you know more more maneuverable. It was fast, like it was more more maneuverable going fast. It was more maneuverable going slow, you know. So they were they like they were having a lot of trouble fighting this thing. Yeah, and I mean, did they get an A or an E from us? Well, they not got from an us. E. Ooh, oh shit! Okay, so they got even like the the improved version, and they were okay. Yeah. Yeah, the I mean the E was no the F I V is no slouch. Um, it, I think it was the first American jet fighter that could accelerate in a climb. Oh really? Uh, it would have to yeah. be clean, I imagine. Yeah, but like it was it was a good airplane, you know. Yeah. Um. So yeah, the it it, it kicked the ass out like of the Mig twenty three. Now, granted, I'm pretty sure during these flyoffs, they're like fighting to the death, right? Like sure. they're not really doing things. Like they like they're they're not. The MiG twenty three is not launching like R R twenty seven EMs, you know, from a BVR yeah. distance. Yeah. But so like, but so so this is all like analyzing, um, in close range dogfighting, which is the F 5s like strong suit, right? So you know that that kind of so like it's to to me it's also partially unsurprising that the F five is able to do so well. You know, it, it's also to bring up. Or it's important to bring up the fact that um, the F five didn't have any BVR missiles at all. Like it didn't have oh, any capability to carry sparrows. Um, yeah, that's. I think that's part of the export. Actually, the the short range kind of makes sense too, because if you export it to a country, you don't want them to go like you know haywire and try taking on another country with them. <laughs> they're de- yeah, they're very defensive aircraft. Yeah, but like they were really impressed by the F five, and like even as it was kicking the asses of their MiG twenty threes. They knew that this was not, like, this was not the good airplane. Right. Right, like, they knew that this was the airplane that America's basically giving away. Yeah, and they knew, like, um, if this was so good, then what the hell do they have behind that curtain? Like, holy right. shit. It's, it's like, if, if this, like, if this, like, do- dollar general fighter is kicking the asses of, of our of our flogger, then, like, what's what's the um, name brand? Like, what's the what's a good airplane? For what's the high versus the low? Right, so, like, in a lot of ways, you know, we all, like, everyone likes to, to, like, everyone knows the story of the fox bat accidentally scaring the USSR, or the, the US into developing the F-15, right? Like, into us making this, this air superiority fighter that's, like, the king, the indisputed king forever, basically. But the F-5 <laughs> did that shit to the USSR. <laughs> yeah, like, kind the of F-5 backwards. is what spurred the USSR to, to start upgrading, like, thinking about how they need to actually like upgrade their air tra- like their their air force um which spawned the MiG-29 and the and the flanker. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, obviously the flanker when it was developed was also kind of a counter to the F-15, but when they started developing their next generation aircraft, it was definitely heavily influenced by what they learned from the F-5. Right. And more importantly, like 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 not so much specifically what they learned from the F-5, but also like what's like what's the, like where the american like aerospace industry is if the f5 is what we're giving away right so yeah that's fun yeah and um we decided that uh in the late 70s we would even make it better <laughs> you think you think the f5 as it is now already scaring the shit out of the soviets could not get any better ladies and gentlemen but yes it can you can replace its two little... I forget the designation for the engines. You can... What is it, Jordan? Uh, J, uh, J85s. J85s. Great little compact engines for the aircraft. 
They put this oversized fucking GE404 engine in from an F-18 and a bunch of modern avionics, and they came up with what was called the F-5G. And that was miles ahead of any F-5 that had come before it. Um, it had, like, an MFD in it. It had the ability to carry uh, AIM-7 Sparrows. And eventually they renamed it to F-20 Tiger Shark. Uh, it was supposed to be the next big export fighter, but there were also plans to have it be our next aggressor because it had a lot of capabilities that Russian aircraft would have had at the time, but also be very easily maintainable. The thing the thing was just as easy to maintain somehow as yeah. the F-5E. Yeah, I mean, you, you cut down the number of motors that you have to maintain by, by half. Yeah. You know, which is which goes a long way. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm pretty sure, and I don't know this from personal experience because I've never worked on the F-20, but I'm pretty sure the LRUs are easier to get to in an F-20. Like, I, I think they basically just did a lot of the quality of life updates on the F-5. Yeah. And, um, it, and then made a badass commercial for it. Like, goddammit, they make a badass commercial for holy it. Holy shit. Like... <laughs> the F twenty, like if if I had, if I had the money, I would totally just buy one based on that commercial alone. Mm-hmm. That thing is so fucking cool. Um, not as good as an F sixteen, but it had the BVR capability initially because the F sixteen did not have the capability to carry sparrows. That's very important. No, it did not. And yeah, that that it didn't. I don't even think it carried sparrows. Did it carry sparrows in nineteen ninety one? Like, did um, it have sparrows in Desert Storm? The F-16C Block 15 was the first to carry any BVR weapons, and I don't think the vanilla F-16As and Cs got Sparrow capability. I think they just went to AMRAMs. Okay. Now, they had yeah, they had the F-16 ADF, which was like the uh, Air Defense Command variant, and those right. could carry Sparrows. Those were like the only F-16s that could carry Sparrows, if, I know, if I'm speaking correctly. That's hilarious. Yeah, and those were like fucking... The equivalent of Block 10 F-16As. So they had, like, the original cockpit and everything just with the capability of having sparrows. Yeah, and that kind of... that Like, in a lot of ways, that's, that, that's kind of, like, how the F-20... Uh, or, the, like, the, the F-5G and the F-20 kind of appear, right? Because, like, in terms of flight, per, like, flight performance, it's not an F-16. Right. It's, it's inferior to a Viper, um, but it can carry sparrows. You know, so like it's it's yeah. it's interesting, like where exactly it fits into the ecosystem of nineteen eighties United States military defense projects. Well, that was the problem because it had a very specific capability set that nobody really needed. Right. It was better than an F five E, but not better than an F-16 to the point where it warranted buying F-20s versus F-16. So anybody who had F- F-5s were going to F-16s easily. And it was not supposed to be a direct competitor to the F-16, though. That's that's the problem. Yeah, it's um, it did cut into the F-16's potential market because, like, if you were a country with a GDP that could support new airplanes, but, like, say, for example, if, like, the F-16 was $10... And the F five or sorry the F the F twenty was like six or seven dollars, and you had like I don't know twenty one dollars to to spend. You could buy three F sixteens or three F twenties for the price of like two F sixteens, right? Right. So like having like even though its capabilities weren't up to par with the F sixteen, its capabilities were still good enough that it still threatened the market. Mm-hmm. of like the potential export market for the viper um so like at like and this was kind of sad like as as a person of taiwanese descent who the f20 was basically made for or the f5g was basically made for <laughs> you know, we 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 weren't allowed to get them jimmy carter said no one one china policy said uh bing chilling <laughs> and um, the F5G said, said goodbye. <laughs> so. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Taiwan did upgrade their F5s with the avionics package, right? Mm, kind of. Yes. Uh, uh, yes and no. They they never... They did uh, try to get... Okay, so get get this. <clears throat> um, they, they marketed... They modified a single F5E 
call it the Tiger two, 2000, and leapfrogged the F-20. Um, okay. The Tiger 2000 was able to carry AMRAMs. Oh, whoa, okay. <laughs> so the ta- Taiwanese version of the M120, the Taiwanese equivalent of the AMRAM was called the TC2, the Tianjian 2, Skysaur 2. And they de- originally de- developed it for the AIDC FCK1, the IDF, the uh, uh, Jingguo, named after the late president. And um, which in- which itself, honestly, warrants a- its own video, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, oh, we'll get to but, that one someday. Yeah, like they basically made this made this indigenous fighter that was better than a Block Ten F sixteen in every single way. Like it, it had AMRAMs. Like goddamn, right? Yeah. Um, when F sixteen couldn't even carry sparrows, right? So like, by making this airplane, the State Department was able to be like, okay, like Taiwan's able to make a better airplane than what we're trying to sell them, so we can use that as grounds to justify us selling them Vipers. Yeah. Yeah, that makes but sense. they they did like a lot of these. So a lot of the the avionics and systems that went into the IDF AIDC incorporated into this F five Tiger two uh, two thousand. I see. And um, the, the ROC Air Force eventually didn't buy it because they knew that they they felt like they were going to retire the F fives at that point, like pretty pretty soon. It it didn't happen. They're still flying them today as lead and fighter trainers. But anyway, like they didn't buy the Tiger 2000, but they did ad- adopt, like, certain aspects of it. Like, the F-20's uh, shark nose, that's standard on all ta- Taiwanese F-5s now. Um, the the extended lurks on the F-20s, like, you know, the wider lurks, that's also yeah. standard on all the F-5s. And, and uh, I'm pretty sure they have, like, a modified version of the F-20's radar. And they're still using it. And they're still, still using it, yeah, so... As a lead-in fighter trainer, so like before you go to go to your Mirage, your IDF, or your uh, F-16, um, every Taiwanese fighter pilot spends some time flying in the F the, the F-5 squadron, and there are the adversary squadron in Taiwan still still flies the F-5. That uh, makes sense because um, the mainland is still operating like the J-7s and shit too, so that that right. tracks. <clears throat> yeah, you know, going back to the whole AIM-7 capability that the F-20 had kind of was detrimental to it to have the aim seven yeah. <laughs> yeah because right. because like if we're exporting this thing we're exporting to people who we don't necessarily want to have bvr capabilities because if you think about west germany their f4f didn't have any sparrow capability until like after the cold war ended and they became regular germany again much to the chagrin of german mains on war thunder you are correct yes and <laughs> So, going by that, why would we export this plane that has the capability to do something even our F-16 can't do? Well, the F-20 was a private venture by Northrop, remember? So, they, like, it wasn't really done. Well, like, that's why we didn't of, accept it, is what I'm saying. Like, that's right, why... Right, like, in a lot, of, a lot of ways, it didn't really have the checks and balances that you would think, like, a government right. contract would have. Like, there wasn't really a statement of work or a proposal <laughs> that was written for it. <laughs> it was Northrop being like, haha, what if we did this? Haha, what if we did that? And like, gave it this or gave it that. Or well, going made, by that, or though, put this on this. Why would they even get the title F24? Was that just conceptual? Like a what they, if name? They, um, they asked for the, the designation. Okay. They got special okay. Per- permission. I see. Okay. And they so didn't they got like that how far. F19 sounded. So they went with F20. Oh, I was going to say, like, you know, F19, you know, that was probably reserved for uh, something else, but. You mean the F18? Super Hornet? <laughs> um, not ne- not necessarily. I was actually thinking, like, I, I had I had a head cannon. I have okay. no idea how true this is. Probably not true at all. The F-117 designation, when you think about it, makes sense because it's kind of one of the covert projects. It's kind of like how we called the um, the MiG-21 we captured. Like, the, YF, the YF-1, uh, the YF-114. 114. YF 114. And it, yeah, and it follows the, the Red Eagles stuff out in to- Tonopah. Yeah, it follows that naming convention because we don't want it to be like a mainline aircraft. Right. Part of me was thinking maybe F-19 was reserved for that for a while, but they decided just not to change it. Oh. Yeah, it's po- possible. I, that's just that's just me speculating. I have no idea. I, I also think the F, like the Super Horn, the Rhino was like enough of a different airplane. Yeah, that... but the Rhino wasn't even a thing until like 1997. Right, but they, they should have called it like the F-19 Wasp. That would have been cool. <laughs> that would have been pretty neat. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, 
Yes. Where what were they we? really should should have done was not make it look like an F eighteen because like you know you know this mm-hmm. that if that airplane came out without having to look like an F eighteen, it would be like a Euro canard. Oh yeah. Nice like, tactical. Because cool, like that was what everything that came out in nineteen ninety looked like, right? Yeah. So like we would be having like we'd be flying like the American version, like the Bandit Keith version of the ty- Typhoon <laughs> off of carriers right now. Like how badass would that be? That would be cool. I don't know how well canard aircraft would work on a carrier though. I'm sure they'd do fine. It's just the Rafale M does fine. It doesn't have a yeah. Canard. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Huh. SC thirty three has canards. <laughs> yeah, you know McDonnell Douglas was trying to like pull a fast one by making it look like an F eighteen. It's a completely different airplane. Let's be real. Con- Convair got caught trying to do that. The F one hundred six was originally called the F one hundred two B. Oh, naughty, yeah. naughty. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Convair got their their PP slapped. <laughs> At least, you know, Northrop stayed with their guns with the F-5. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. the F-20 still at its heart is an F-5 variant. Right. You want to talk about how the F-5 became the F-18? <laughs> what? What the f- <laughs> Oh, yeah. So, this is a really, really long story. And... We can... Just... We can... Show... We'll no, 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 no. No, no, no. We'll, we'll, we'll cover it. I just... I just gotta take a break. <laughs> I just gotta right. take a bio break. <laughs> So we're, yeah. we'll reconvene in a few minutes. <laughs> You're... Alrighty, ladies and gentlemen, I have returned from the bio break, and we were shifting over to how the F-5 literally became the F-18. <laughs> now you're going to think, Falcon, what the hell are you talking about? But hear us out. Yeah. Um. So there was a project for a light fighter. For the Air Force back in, I think it was the early '70s. Jordan, you would probably know a little bit more about that. So why don't you, why don't you fill me in a little bit? Because I, I know a little well, bit about this, but you know more. Starts a little before that, right? So okay. even like, as the F5E was rolling, off, like the first F5Vs were rolling off the assembly line of Hawthorne, California. Um, Northrop was like, "How are we going to make this better?" Right? Because like Northrop had stuck to their guns. Like the F5 was the Northrop fighter. Right, like, they the wanted Northrop... that to be the fighter. Like, and right. honestly, for the fifties, it would have been a fucking great fighter. It, I mean, as shit, a mainline, even like a nineteen sixty-five, like, could, like take the F five and like put it next to any other airplane that was flying around in 60, 65. Like, it, 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 it's a contemporary of the Phantom, yes, but it looks just that much more modern than a Phantom does. Oh yeah, you know, it's got that like cool Coke bottle Astro look to it. Right. Yeah. With, you know, with the, with the area roll. Uh, fuselage the the shark shaped nose the trapezoidal wing that somehow eventually evolved into a low observable design feature but not really but accidentally you know like <laughs> it's like peak adam punk it really is um but basically they're looking at all the shortcomings of the f5e excuse me and they were like how are we going to make it better right so the first proposal was make the wing bigger because the f5e's Ach- achilles heel is the lack of range Make, make the wing bigger, give it a wet wing, and then also move the wing higher up on the fuselage to give you more clearance underneath the wings to carry a, a bigger variety of ordnance. Um, give it more powerful engines, and this they called this design the N300. And um, the un- N300, I think this one was, I'm not sure if, uh, yeah, no, the P600 came, the or the, the P530 came, came later, but it basically evolved into what's called the P530, which was nicknamed okay. the Cobra. Yeah, I'm looking at a picture of it right now, and it looks like... A, dude, it looks like a fucking Fallout take on an F8. <laughs> the N- N300? Uh, yeah. yeah I, wait. So, if you're looking at the... The P530, um, sorry. <clears throat> yeah, the P- P530, it's like with the fuse, or like with the co- cockpit all the way, like in the front, it's got the quarter, yeah. quarter, the quarter, uh, the quartered shock cones, like in the, in the intakes, like, oh yeah, this like thing the, had fucking shock cones, this thing's gonna go Mach 2 easily. It's, it's like the pri- primordial F-18. <laughs> yeah, this had like all the, the design hallmarks of like the mid-60s, just yeah. slapped onto an F-18 aesthetic. Right, and it's, it's fucking sick. Yeah, um, it is. But... Basically, they they took that. They called it the Cobra because if you look at it from the front, the Lurks looks like the hood of a Cobra. No, yeah, that makes sense. Um, so that's where the nickname ca- came from. 
But if you look at the wings, they're like twice as big in terms of area as that of an F5. Um, the Lurks, the leading edge extensions, were even more pronounced than the than than, than the F5, and they're also bigger, right? So they leave like from all the way from like the leading edge of the wings all the way basically to the front of the fuselage. Um, without getting t- too much into it, like this Lurks design. It, it basically made the airplane a lot more maneuverable at higher AOA, but it also gave it more lift. Sorry, AOA, angle of attack. Um, and additionally, after they, you know, put it in the wind tunnel a bunch of times, they found out that a single tail, that like the F5, didn't provide um, enough lift at higher AOA. They gave it a, a twin set of vertical stabilizers at like 45 degrees that gave it a lot like both more longitudinal stability but also made the maneuverability even more you know so it was a highly maneuverable airplane like like the entire thing is like a is like a moment arm dude Um, the fact that they're like these oh sorry sorry i was just gonna say the fact that they're 45 degrees is really unique because not even the hornet has that yeah (laughs) yeah super spacey right yeah so in 71 like when the lwf project really kicked off they um northrop adapted the p530 into what's called the p600 and that's that is what they entered as the yf-17 that we know today so um you kind of think of it like an f-16 sized hornet you know it's the in terms of the design it's matured a lot it looks very much like legacy hornet um but still retaining some of that f5 dna yeah and yeah, I mean, there you have it. That's literally like the ultimate F five evolution. Like, if if you really if you really want to get into the nitty gritty, because McDonnell Douglas helped make the um, YF seventeen carrier capable when the F eighteen. Do you know the story was... behind that? I do. Well, what, like, what do, do you, you mean? know why they selected McDonnell Douglas to do it? Uh, because they had experience with the Phantom, right? Right, right, right. That, but also because like neither of the Air Force companies had ever made something for the Navy. Like, neither General Dynamics oh, yeah. or Northrop had ever worked with the Navy. That's not necessarily so, true, because General Dynamics worked with Grumman to make the F-111B. I'm pretty sure that came... Um, that came after... Or, that came before, because that was 1966. But it wasn't adopted, was it? No, it wasn't. Right. So, they want to... They, they, paired, um, they paired General Dynamics with uh, LTV. Who that would have been a, a cool... A that would have been they, a cool alternate history. And, yeah, and then they paired... Um, Northrop with McDonnell Douglas, so that's that's why. So so basically, I think the stipulation was like, if the F sixteen like was gonna be adopted by the Navy, like it would it would be a Vought product. So I think it's called the Vought sixteen hundred was the navalized F sixteen concept. Yeah, and if I recall correctly, that was dispelled really really quickly because the uh, the F seventeen just had so much more going for it for naval operations. Right. Like I think there's like one bit of concept art for the uh navalized f-16 yeah i'm looking at it now it's got like vf i don't know if it's black, 41. black aces vf-41 yeah. markings yeah it's black yeah. aces it's pretty sick up. um but yeah no like um yeah mcdonald douglas took over the uh they didn't really take it over you know northrop did have big involvement in it but like if you think about the whole lineage going all the way back to the original f5 prototype that is the direct ancestor to the Rhino that is currently in service now. <laughs> and it's funny because the Rhino is now a Boeing product. Yeah. <laughs> it's so wild. <laughs> it's so cursed. Um, yeah, so the so basically McDonnell Douglas was the prime contractor. So like Northrop still made like parts of the F fifteen. Or sorry, the F eighteen. Um I think Northrop made the back and M D made the front or something. I don't know. But Northrop was the sub, and um, MDD Mickey D was the the prime. Dom. Do you ever? Do you guys ever? Yeah, like, do you guys ever think that like defense contractors and BDSM relationships are fired each other as prime and sub? Dude, Jesus don't answer Christ. that. <laughs> I'm not gonna go there. <laughs> um, while we're here, do you want to talk about the F-18L at all, or is that just too the Land different? Hornet? Yeah. Um. I have no experience. I I don't know much about that. So if if you if you've got some insight, it was completely conceptual, but it still had Northrop markings. That was like Northrop's Northrop's part of the uh, F eighteen program. They were gonna do the land based right. version, 
And it was going to basically be an F-18, but with, like, no tail hook and more Air Force-style landing gear to cut down on weight. So that actually would... Potential customers... I I don't know if they ever actually pitched it to anybody, but I th- I've seen Israeli markings um, on models. Um, I think the Hellenic Air Force is somebody they tried pitching to, but I don't know if it ever got anywhere past just, like, building concept models. Like, they did build a mock-up of it. Um, here, I'll send you a picture of it. It's pretty sweet. And it's got North or Britain on the nose. There you go. Oh, and it's a two seater too, cute. which is very yeah, dude. Uh, it's oh, wow, it's got three MERS. Yeah, holy yeah, because you don't have to worry about the uh, navy landing gear, so you can carry more shit. Oh my god, that's this sweet. would have been pretty neat. Obviously, they just decided to export the F eighteen A without any modifications. Sparrows um, on the wingtips. Yeah, go. Yeah. This would have been a fucking cool fighter. I mean, the F-18A on its own was a great export, and Canada is still using it, but... Um, yeah. This was, uh, this was the alternative that Northrop is going to offer, is, like, the Air Force option. Right. That's funny. Yeah. Yeah, well, originally, I mean... It was really funny, because it's like, F-18. yeah, we lost the Air Force competition, but we're still... We're not out of the... I, I, I ain't hear no bell. <laughs> yeah. Well, originally, they were going to... If you count the F-18L, there were going to be four different F-18 variants that were going to be um, put out before they made the whole F-18 and A-18 were were originally split, right? Yes, they were. You had the F-18 and you had the A-18. Then you had the TF-18, and then you had the F-18L. (laughs) That's insane. Yeah, I like the F-18. It's a cool story. It's a it's a fantastic story. Yeah, and it all starts with the F-5. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It, it's it's crazy how far they've come yeah um so going back to the f5 um we pretty much know it's general development history now so what mm-hmm. did it actually really do i mean you told me something today that i have never heard of at all yeah and i really so... want to make a video about it now <laughs> area 88 was real i guess Area 88 was real, and it was a Taiwanese drama. <laughs> so instead of a Japanese drama, yeah, it was a, it was a Japan, it was a Ta- Taiwanese Saudi Arabian co-production that was filmed on location in northern Yemen. <laughs> um, so let's let's like like so to barely touch on the geopolitics, right? Uh, Yemen had a really strong ties to Saudi Arabia. Um, and they were actually currently, like, they were going through a destabilization in, in this, in 1979. And there was the Soviet-backed Southern Yemen that was fighting against the Yemen Arab Republic, which was, I guess, Northern Yemen. Um, Yemen's not a huge country, you know, and I think, like, what they're mostly known for is, like, Osama bin Laden. But, um, like, 70, 70 mil- like they have a population of 70 million people, you know, and the seventh of that worked in Saudi Arabia, you know, on the oil fields or elsewhere. And Saudi Arabia didn't want Yemen to destabilize, right? So they, they, it was in Saudi Arabia's best interest that Yemen, ma- like, maintain, um, it's, like, the status quo, basically. So they, 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 they bought a squadron of FIVs because that was what was on the American market to sell people. So they bought a squadron of FIVs for northern Yemen, and um, they bought some FIVs to help train the pilots. But the problem was that, like, by the end of the year, because America was so good at making shit and delivering shit, by the end of 1979, all 16 of these airplanes had arrived in Saudi Arabia, but the Saudis weren't able to train the Yemenis themselves. Oh, so what they did was they had they made an agreement with Taiwan to deploy like a mercenary squadron of like I think like around a hundred people, um, including pilots, gr- ground crews, maintainers, everyone to help stand up the Yemeni's air force. Hmm. And um, they were these were called the the uh, the the Desert Squadron in Chinese, which is very Area Eighty Eight esque. And what what would that actually be in Chinese? Uh, shit. It's like Samo Zong Zong Dui, like okay. the squadron of the the desert. And most and like you know, most of the squadron members of like the 112 squadron, which was the FIV squadron, were actually ta- Taiwanese until the year 1985, when they finally actually trained enough 
native uh, Yemenis to, to take over their flying duties. And mm. these guys were, like, straight up, like, actually actively involved in combat. You know, like, attacking southern Yemeni troops, even engaging southern Yemeni's MiGs. Um, so, like, this was straight up, like, Area 88 happening in, in Yemen. Um, it, it ended in the 90s because that's when Saudi Arabia formally recognized the People's Republic of China. Okay. So, um, you know, they... Unfortunately. Right. But, like, initially... But it's, it's, it's ironic because or- originally the Saudis picked the Taiwanese to, to do this because, one, they had a lot of F5 experience, but, two, they felt that the Taiwanese would relate to their plight of having communists in their backyard, right? Like, huh. this whole thing started because the because uh, Yemen was destabilized by communists, by, yeah. by the USSR. And so they were like, well, the Chinese know how that feel, right? So if we get... Like, I'm sure they'll help us. And they, and they did. So and just to give you guys an idea fun. of how fucking crazy this is, this is like if now in Ukraine, we sent a bunch of pilots over to help train the Ukrainian Air Force fly F-16s, um, but they didn't get enough pilots ready to go yet. So Americans have to fly the F-16s against the, you know, against the Russian invasion. Or it would be like Americans... It'd be like... I'm trying to think of a country that would do that like fuck like unironically taiwan <laughs> like if they <laughs> unironically you know what i i wouldn't put it past them like yeah like, it's, it's like a unity like thing if we had the rocap like training contingent from luke air force base like yo <laughs> yeah and i'd be like hey you guys are gonna need combat experience by 2027 i mean real talk they're kind of in a similar situation you know with like yeah the prc coming down on them our social credit score is going way down right now eh, i don't care <laughs> <laughs> you you literally cannot go to the PRC. I literally ever. am not allowed to travel to mainland China, <laughs> and I don't want to. So <laughs> we're good. We're being, we're good. being chilly. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, what's their equivalent of the KGB? They have fuck if I know. Um, TikTok mods. <laughs> yeah, TikTok. <laughs> Yeah, if you use TikTok, don't. <laughs> yeah. That's me on a soapbox, but that's beside the point. We're talking about the F5, I think. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah. So, who still flies these things, right? We talked about Taiwan, how they still fly them in limited, yep. like, very small um, numbers. I'm pretty sure South Korea is in a similar deal. They so do, yeah. as yep. the South Koreans get more of their... Um... So, as South Korea gets more T- T-50s, the F5 is going to get phased out. Same thing with Taiwan. As Taiwan gets more of that that T five that that trainer, it's yeah. going to phase out the F fives from their, um, from their squadron use as well. The oh, there, there's still adversary squadrons in the United States Navy and the U.S. Marine Corps that fly F fives. Um, up until very recently, VFC thirteen, the Fighting Saints out in Fallon, um, they flew F fives. They recently switched them in for F sixteens. For oh, over- they did. Air Force F-16s, yep. Oh, wow. I didn't know um, that. I thought they were still using F-5s, but... Yeah, so oh. so the Saints are, are now an F-16 squadron. Uh, how about VFC-111? They gave VFC all their F-5s to, um, to 204. So VFA-204 okay. in New Orleans is redesignated VFC-204. The, the, the River Rattlers. And the Rattlers are trading in their old, F-15, their old F-18As for F-5s as well. Um, so they're... So, VFC-13, no longer an F-5 squadron. VFC-204 is now an F-5 squadron. Uh, VFC-111 in Key West, they mm-hmm. still fly. The the Sundowners, they still fly the F-5. They still got them, okay. We, we work very closely with them. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you do. There's, gonna, there's two Marine squadrons. So USM, so uh, VMFT-401, the Snipers, they're historically a Kafir squadron. Um, they're now flying F-5s and... The, they're standing up another marine squadron called VF VMFT four hundred two, which I think is going to be located at MCAS Beaufort, which is going to be another F five squadron. So we're we're going from, uh, from three navy ad- or yeah three navy adversary squadrons all F five. Or, or sorry, we're going from uh, we're adding another F five squadron basically to the USM to to the USMC adversary squadrons here in the states. And, and they're going to have them for a long time, knowing the Marine Corps. Yeah, because um, the the Marine Corps is last in line to get their um, their F five N plus upgrade. So that's that's going to be fun. 
um, tactical air support is operating. So we own about two dozen F5Es that that are upgraded to like AT standard. We have about a dozen airplanes that fly around. Um, and there's going to be basically a total of like there's 20 airplanes that are that we're buying from um, from Sw Switzerland and those Swiss jets are coming in to also be upgraded to be F5 N pluses and then there's going to be like like the the 50-ish that are currently still flying within the adversary squadrons are going to be be rotated in to be upgraded as well so eventually there's going to be like the, the F5 there's going to be like around 70 to 80 um navy and marine corps ad adversary f5s in the squadrons the swiss are are getting rid of of all their their f5 e's and we would like to acquire them we're currently still in the process of acquiring all the like a bunch of saudi f5s so that's that's going to be fun and the current tac tacker fleet is made up of former jordanian air force f5 e's so you know what the irony of all of this is jordan the U.S. is finally going to be the primary um, user of the F-5. <laughs> yeah, once everyone's, like, done using them, like, once we've hoodwinked them into buying F-35s, they're like, all right, now give us your F-5s. <laughs> um, it's funny that you mentioned that, because the J-85s, the, the motors, are actually kind of hard to come by now. Hmm. Well, there is one country that is uh, still using them potentially against us and i'm sure we're not going to give them any j85s either i i've joked about like trading things to the iranians because when we were trying to get tip caps for vertical stabilizers i was like you know what the iranians are making new new production ones let's just buy them from iran and like <laughs> give them like shit i don't know tomcat nose gear or something <laughs> <laughs> have you seen that one weird iranian f5 that's like painted like a blue a blue angel Oh, like the Seca, the uh, two-tailed one. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, is, is, is that what it's called? Yeah, I I don't know how I I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. I'm I'm I think it's Seca, but um, yeah. So Iran developed their own indigenous version of the F five, and they gave it two tails for some reason. Um, <laughs> that might help. <laughs> they wanted to give it more lift at high AOA. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're 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 following the uh, the northern path. Yeah. <laughs> And I don't, like, nobody really knows what this thing actually has in it. Like, it might just be a vanilla F5E that just has two tails. We don't know. It, it could be. No, actually, we do know. Uh, oh, really? I, yeah, shit. Trying to... <laughs> There's a cockpit reveal. It's got a glass co cockpit. Yeah, but is it all, like, off-the-shelf Garmin shit? Or is it, like... Um, a... I mean, we have off-the-shelf Garmin shit. <laughs> yeah, but you have an excuse because, like... You're a I'm private company. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you we, also we do use a D3000 flight deck. The, yeah. the, that Iranian thing, I mean, it's got, I'll send you a photo so you can throw up on the screen for your viewers. Um, but it's got MFDs. Like, it, it's, it, it looks kind of like a Legacy Hornet cockpit, if not better. So I see MFDs, but I don't see any keys around them. So they look like just monitors with no buttons. Oh, yeah, that, I mean, shit. It could be like ra <laughs> raspberry pies, you know. Like we do, we don't, Yo. we don't really. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So they have the Kafir three one three, the only other fifth generation fighter outside of the U S. Uh, China and Russia fighter. <laughs> Dude, I want to do a video on the Kafir three one three so badly. <laughs> three thousand black jets against of fifth generation fighters. <laughs> The thing is, make 17 wings. <laughs> it's okay. such a shitbox. But can you imagine flying around this thing? So, um, there's this, like, Tupolev 154. What the fuck? With an F5 cockpit that's, like, grafted onto the tail. Is it, like, an ejection trainer or yeah, something? Yeah, it's, like, a, oh, it's okay. like a test bed of, of some, some sort. I but mean, like, it makes sense, but do they... That's an actual guy ejecting from it. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> oh, no. That's a Russian ejection seat, too. Oh, it, yeah, it is. It's called the, the, the little things coming off the back of it. What the... F oh, boy. That's, um... That's a modification right there. Mm-hmm. How would you... Jordan, okay. If you were tasked with putting a Russian ejection seat into one of your F5s, 
how angry would you get? Well, I mean, right now I'm trying to put thirty pounds of thir- thirty pounds of shit in the five pound sack, so I'm already pretty upset. The Russian ejection seat would actually probably be not that difficult. The North okay. the stock Nor- Northrop seat is kind of a piece of shit. Yeah, in a lot of ways, it, it's not a zero zero seat either. It's not a zero zero seat. Yeah, um, we're the the Martin Baker seat that we're replacing them with is a much better seat. Oh, good. Um. Is it an Asus two or no? Asus two is a little big, isn't it? No, it's it? a Mark Mark sixteen, I believe. Okay. So, yeah, I would like it to be Asus two. It'd be cool if we could put an Asus two, but it, the the uh, cockpit's not deep enough. I'm trying to think of yeah. deep is the yeah, it's not deep enough for an Asus two. Mm. Yeah, and it's not like you can just crank it back like an F sixteen either, because that'd be like really fucking weird for ergonomics. Yeah. It's pretty pretty rad. Yeah, that's cool though. I'm I'm glad you guys are getting better ejection seats. Holy shit. Yeah, yeah. There's there's a lot of cool technology that's going into yeah. these in, into these F5s to to keep them relevant. So, like you currently flying now though, you still have the Northrop seats, right? Yes, the company jets, the TAC Air F5s have Northrop seats. The jets that we're upgrading for the Navy have the Martin Baker seats. Um, we're using the so NASA actually flies T thirty eight still, and the NASA actually upgraded their T thirty eights to have the Martin Baker seats. Um, so like, if you have a gear collapse or something on takeoff, like, what the fuck do you do? Just ride it in? We'll be okay. We'll be we'll okay. Be fine. <laughs> okay, I just I just worry about you, like as a friend. <laughs> yeah, I'll be fine. <laughs> okay. Um, where things have happened, like the F five can survive a belly landing. Okay. Yeah. Are there's you, like, the, trying to hint something there? There's a there, great or? photo of Attack Air F5 having a belly oh. landing. I didn't know this. Yeah. It was a long, long story without getting too much into it. No, that's fine. But, that's fine. like, the initial mod, we did... Um, There was always a problem with the gear indication, the landing gear indication lights on, on our mod. And, um... And so, like, it wouldn't indicate if the gear was up or down. Like, you wouldn't have your, your lights on. And, uh, so a pilot... I guess he didn't know, and he just he just bellied it in. Very minimal damage, actually. The, the airplane was able to take off. Um, like, we repaired it, and it was flying again in a couple months. Wow. So, I mean, I don't know if that says a lot about the airplane or if it says about our fantastic MRO out at Reno State Airport, but um, the F-5 can, can handle a belly landing. Hmm. I mean, it's got a pretty flat belly, so yeah. it makes sense. A lot of those belly panels are made of magnesium. I bet they spark like a mother. Yeah, and it's and it's kind of annoying because um, you're not supposed like so you're not su- like you're not supposed to uh, layer different types of metal on top of each other because there, it it causes like different sort of stress and and uh, corrosion. So sure. a lot of panels that are on the belly of the airplane that are now getting antennas fitted on them for you know different fun stuff. Um, like making these uh, double or some antennas too and whatnot is is a fun activity. Hmm. So there's a lot that goes into like upgrading these airplanes still, and I I suspect that Tac Air's modified F fives and the Navy's F fives that we're building for them are going to be flying well into the twenty twenty forties. Hope hopefully. <laughs> That's wild to think about, given the original design is from the fifties. Yeah. Right. It's a uh, it is crazy, and like I feel incredibly proud to be part. To, to be part of it um, like dude you're nearing b52 legacy the, timeline I, I mean it's 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 crazy because like like the f5 used to be like the, the first jet you get an ace combat right like an ace yeah. combat uh, like five and four i think yeah five four sure. it's like the second one but five yes definitely yeah so um like as a kid i'd always be like yeah i want to fly the f5 as long as i can because it's like the starter plane i want to see how good i am and then like you you, you pick the f5 like, I would pick the F-5 until, like, the crazy space lasers and super weapons were, like, too good. Mm-hmm. And my, like, 20 missiles weren't enough, and I had to pick the Raptor or something, right? Like, going, yeah. going from that, like, going from being that kid sitting in front of my t- TV, you know, past midnight when I was supposed to, to be asleep, flying, flying the F-5, to, like, being part of this company and, like, being part of the, basically the A-156 story, like, the F-5 story. 
um and like helping maintain these things and like cement its spot in aviation history into the future it's, it's kind of a humbling experience i will say that the original developers of the f5 would be very very proud of you oh i hope so i i think so i mean but, like if i like, designed you know, Ed, edgar schmude also might just call me a slur you know <laughs> they say never to meet your heroes <laughs> <laughs> well okay fair enough <laughs> oh man i'm just kidding yeah. if there's any like family or relatives of edgar schmude that know him and like if he was like a super wholesome dude who who didn't have a racist bone in his body i apologize and i don't mean to defame Mr. Schmood, like I really admire him, and I there's so many times that I, I wish that I could talk to him and like pick his brain about how he designs certain things. Yeah, I mean, like you know, not everybody was a racist back in the '50s. There were just a lot more of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what, do you have any? Do you have any fun F five stories? Things that you remember from your childhood? Um, like when's the first time you see one in real life? In real life? Yeah. Oh, uh, boy. I think I saw one at Niagara Falls Air Show back in 1997. I think they had one of the aggressors come in for doing, like, a little demo or, like, a fly-in That's or something. That's so sick. Yeah, I, I barely remember it. But they, they also had, like, a Tomcat fly and everything. And um, I, I recall seeing one on a tarmac when I was a kid. Okay. That's all I really, really remember about it. Um, I... <sighs> I'm probably going to cut this out, but I want you to hear this story. <laughs> I was I was probably four years old. Okay. And this is when they still had F4Es. This is like the last year they had F4Es before they retired them. This is like, it would have been 96, so I was three. And it was painted in Euro 1 camouflage. And I really wanted to go up and see it because it was different. Different from right. all the gray ones. Yeah. And my dad was like, he he's working at the aerial port, drinking a beer or whatever. It wasn't working. He was just, you know, at his workplace watching the show and i ran up to him and i'm like daddy i want to go see the colored planes and his 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 master sergeant was a black dude and he looked over <laughs> <laughs> and, and like and i'm referring to colored planes as in like camouflage you know but he's like right. you know you know colored haha and he starts laughing and he's like well you better go take him over and show him You should leave that story in. I I don't I might I might. It's wholesome. It's, it's kind of wholesome. Yeah yeah. It's not like I wanted <laughs> the, the to. Colored plates. <laughs> I mean shit. Like even now, right? If you look at all the gray airplanes that the Air Force and Navy fly, like what are the colored planes? Right? It's the the, yeah. the adversaries. Like that's still a thing. Yeah. You know. Yeah, like they're not in Euro One anymore, but they're in like you know Soviet markings and uh, in some cases um, PRC markings. Yeah, Those plaque markings. Yeah, no, it's that's that's pretty great. Yeah, yeah I've, I've never seen a phantom fly before. I guess I did when I was three, but I don't really remember it. Um, right. I would love to see one of the Collings Foundation shows, but they don't really like, get out much. Do those? I mean, yeah, I was I was gonna say they're they haven't really done anything in a while. Yeah, no, I mean especially after all the bullshit with their bomber crash. They they had a bomber crash, right? Nine to nine. Yeah, they yeah. they had a uh, their beast. B seventeen crashed. Yeah, it was nine to nine. Okay, um, they haven't done any real jet demos since then because I, I know they have a flying F one hundred and I know they have a flying F four. Mm -hmm. um, and if they ever ever go back up again, I am more than willing to travel to see them. I'm still kicking myself for not seeing the last QF four demo at Nellis. Wait, what? <laughs> they they had a final. F4 or QF4E demo at the Nellis Air Show back in like 2018 before they retired all the uh, QF4s. QF4E final air show. Yeah, sure is. Yeah. It was 2016. <laughs> but yeah, dude, this is Okay. That's history. I'm I was out in California when this happened. Like I'm kicking myself. You know, like I think about that, right? Like I lived um I don't know, 2 hours from Beale Air Force Base. Mhm. Mm never went out there never want to go out there to see u2s like yeah my 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 buddy mike tells me that like basically if you go on any weekday and hang out there you'll see u2s flying around. okay i but mean i've just never done it we've seen u2s in miramar right but like not in their natural habitat no 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 yeah you know um so that's why like 2021 when 
when I heard that F one seventeens were at Fresno, I was like, I gotta get my ass down there right now. Oh yeah, that's you know, amazing. So I woke up at fucking three in the morning, <laughs> drove all the way, drove my ass out <laughs> to Fresno. You got to, some like, good shots those too. F one seventeens. Yeah, the, 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 I was really proud of those, but like, like that to me was like like worth it it's like seeing like or it's like finding out that there's an f-14 still flying or something you know <laughs> yeah i was gonna say it's like yeah you're, you're gonna edit this but like i was gonna say that like to me that was once in a lifetime and then now like, <laughs> i'm also working on the f-117 programs <laughs> i'm gonna edit that afterward <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm really just like collecting all like the the airplanes that I I want to work on. And like, it's as a child. It's sad because a lot of the childhood airplanes we could have like seen I'm, are now I'm gone. I'm gonna miss on I'm I'm gonna miss out on F-15s. I don't I don't think there's a way for me to weasel onto a Hornet or on, onto an Eagle, uh, like an F-15C program. Unfortunately. I mean the EX the EX is gonna be around. It's still gonna be a an it's, eagle. It, I I guess, but like it's not it's not it's not, it's, it's not the same. Like I wanna I wanna work on the F fifteen C, but yeah. I'm gonna miss that one. It would have been gonna cool. miss Harriers. Yeah, oh I'm god, not gonna to work on Harriers. Harriers are gonna be a stab when they go. Yeah, that was a favorite of mine. I'm so glad I got to see one flying at Miramar too, because dude, that was seeing, a bigger show. Th- seeing that Harrier bow to the crowd, that was that was my oh, favorite yeah, that's part. Right, I did that. that was fucking awesome, dude. Yeah, that's a holdover from like RAF shows. Remember when um, my wait was that the last air show that there were tanks at Miramar? Uh, yeah, that would have been. It was Abrams at that show. Yeah, they had and an then, Abrams like, demo. Like and... months later, they were they, they didn't have Abrams. <laughs> yeah, because they got rid of them. <laughs> yeah. Holy shit! I yeah, that's the one where I got inside the Abrams, took photos. Oh man, I remember um. Oh my god, it was really funny, like. You used to play Steel Steel Beasts, yeah, right? Like the the tank game. Um, this is this is kind of funny because like, I don't know, I don't know if I should talk about this, but it's it's a I'll I'll tell you, you can edit this out. Sure. I remember this one time when 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 we were hanging out, and um, we were like you were, <laughs> it had like been a minute since we all last got got together, and we were like going to an air show or something. And we were all hanging out, like, seeing each other for the first time in a while, like, in Los Angeles. And we are like, Kyle! And then, like, your, your, your then-partner was like, why are you guys acting like you haven't seen him? Don't you guys play games with it? Like, weren't y'all playing games last night? And then Jonathan Tran was like, bro, Steel Beast is a single-player game. Kyle talks to himself. <laughs> <laughs> destroyed in seconds and she was so she was like what <laughs> yo you remember when i bought those three cvc helmets for super cheap and yeah. we were in my apartment <laughs> we were in your bathtub yeah we were pretending it was an abrams cockpit <laughs> yeah because we needed something that was smooth and white <laughs> i still have that photo too. and your bathtub fit the bill for being smooth and white <laughs> Oh, it was a great time, dude. We had some good times. Remember when we, remember when we modified our friend's car into an F-18? Okay, I'm going to have to put that in the podcast. So, <laughs> a long time ago, when most of our viewers were probably still like 10 years old, I, I lived out in San Jose, California, kind of. And we had a friend who was also into aviation with us, but he drove a bright blue car was it was it, it was a, a ford focus ford, ford focus a bright blue ford focus that was in the perfect blue color to be a blue angels like paint scheme <laughs> so at 3 a.m one night also this is after we uh put a bunch of cardboard like spoilers and shit on like two weeks beforehand <laughs> we made a bunch of blue angels themed accessories for it we made, like, the F-18 vertical stabilizers. We made a pair of F-404, like, burner cans. Yeah, we, we made, like, some lurkses, and uh, we put his name... <laughs> we put his name on a... Uh, on a in the, in on the, the cursive In the font. cursive font on a piece of cardboard that we taped right under the window. <laughs> <laughs> and he was so mad the next day. The next morning, he, like, he like exploded on us on Discord. Oh, my God. It was God. really funny because we, like, waited for him to go offline here before we went to his house and did this thing. Like, we were, like, at Walmart at, like, 1 in the morning. 
like waiting for him to to get offline. Also, if you guys are wondering who this person is, um, Ender007 was a great YouTuber back in the day. He he made the best airsoft videos. He nuked all his airsoft videos on YouTube. Yeah, he, he was like the OG GoPro airsofter. He really was. He he was doing shit back in like 2008, 2009. Yeah. Like even before people had GoPros, like he had a GoPro. And not only did he have a GoPro, he played airsoft with it. So like that was that was like next level shit back back in the day. Man, we gotta go airsofting again someday. Yeah, shit. Not me looking up flight tickets to New York, like, right now. Uh, I mean, you're welcome anytime, dude. We can go up to, um, the Buffalo War Zone and hit up. They they have a, uh, converted warehouse. Oh, really? Yeah. It's like an hour and a half nice. away from me. Yeah, dude. Oh, yeah. Whenever you get some time off and you want to just come up here, just let me know. Okay. Yeah, likewise. Yeah, thanks. If you, if you want to come down to, to hang out here, too, y'all, you're also welcome. Okay. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll have a live podcast too. <laughs> It'll be really funny. I mean, it would be easier to edit too. <laughs> It'll be easier to edit. Yeah, and we could do it from may- maybe maybe even a particularly cool hangar. But we'll see. Ooh, maybe we can go to the Curtis Wright Museum if you come up here and record there. Oh yeah, that'd be dope. <laughs> yeah, talk about some P forty shenanigans. I fucking love P P forties. We'll, we'll talk about the is, P40. Is that, is that all to talk about, about the F5? Like, have we covered everything? I, I think we, we have. I mean, yeah, yeah. Like, I, so, I, so as far as, like, development goes, we I didn't really want to go that into it because there's lots of other uh, videos, goes lots in. of other, yeah, lots of, lots of other YouTubers that do a fantastic job of that. I mean, we pretty much covered its, like, operational history and, like, can you, I mean, you can buy an F5. There are some on the civilian market. There are some non- non-adversary civil actually it's the latest addition to the air force heritage flight really yes um i think at the latest u.s air force air show they unveiled an f5 as part of the uh her- the dias air show um there there's like an f5e yep damn yep. that's pretty cool yep <laughs> here i'll show you the i'll, I'll show you the photo it's a it's a Raptor flying with two F five E's painted as like the U S Air Force aggressors from the um the eighties. Wow, and I think there's a few F five B's floating around too. Oh, that's fucking cool. Yeah. Oh yeah, those are slick. I like this. Yeah, it's 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 sweet. Uh, I was gonna say like it's it's cool to finally have. Like a heritage, like a new heritage flight airplane. You yeah, know, that's like not either a prop from World War Two, or like local boomers F eighty six. Yeah, and even then, F eighty sixes are kind of rare now. Yeah, but like it's it's cool because like like basically everything between the F fifteen and the F eighty six was like not covered in all the heritage flights. So now we actually have something that represents the people like who served and the airplanes that served in that time period. Yeah, I mean, you're not going to be able to fund an F4 going up every time, but an F5, you could do that. Right. So, yeah, like, I love that blue ca- camouflage that it's got. Oh, it's so slick. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know if there were any Soviet aircraft that had that paint scheme. Uh, uh, did the flankers have a blue camouflage at one point? Yeah, they did, but, like, late 80s, and they looked completely different. They didn't have that kind of pattern. You know, I wonder if it's... Have you heard of, like, the Curse of the Blue P-51? No. So, there was, like, a really garish camouflage um, blue... Like, not the blue nose one, but there's um, this restoration. Here, I'll find a photo of it. Lou, Lou 4, or Lou 6. It's, like... I think it's the EAA's um, P-51. But it it's, like, painted this light blue. Okay, mm-hmm. so, um, that's oh, how it what looks. What the fuck? Yeah, but it's because like when they based it, when they painted it, they based it off of this photo, and it hadn't been colorized correctly. Oh, wow, that's really <laughs> kind of a cool story, though. <laughs> yeah, um, so like in reality, it's all of drab. You Makes know? sense. But like somebody, and for a long time, we thought that was like because. In black and white, you know, it's like, you well, it's tell. not olive drab because it looks different than the, the, the olive drab strip that's, you know, on the anti-glare. Mm-hmm. So, like, here's a black and white f- 
version. So like the olive drab in front of the anti glare looks like a slightly different shade. And I don't know how they extrapolated blue from that sheen. Um, yeah, but it doesn't someone make too did. Much sense, and they thought it. They thought it was blue. <laughs> somebody with a lot of money made a decision. Yeah, and and now there's a blue P fifty one that shouldn't be blue. <laughs> oh my god, I kind of like it though. Yeah, it's it's kind kind of cute. You Unique. know, the ba- baby blue. It's like something you'd see out of Area 88, but on a World War II fighter. It, it is, yeah. You know, just to talk about North American aircraft, because the P-51 is North American. Mm-hmm. If you check out a P-51 cockpit, then go to an F-86 cockpit, then go to the F-5s, they all sort of feel the same. Like, the dimensions kind of feel comfy and easy to transfer between. Oh, yeah. No, the the F-5, F-86... The F-86 is a fantastic cockpit. Yeah, I'll, like, if you go from an F-86 to an F-5, it feels... There's, there's obvious differences. You have a radar in the F-5. You have, you know, uh, different locations for where the engine starters are and all that bullshit. But it feels like a natural progression. Mm-hmm. And this is just me saying is, you know... I've sat in real ones, but, like, I'm go- I'm just going by, like, you know, DCS in general because that's more accessible to everybody. Um, sure. But, like, it's... You could tell they're from the same company. Just like you can tell the F-14 cockpit is very similar to the A-6s. Like, they have a lot of the same buttons and switches and shit, and it just feels like a Grumman aircraft. Well, something I love about aircraft design is the superficiality of, like, DNA. Yeah. In terms of... Like, so, if you look at Dassault, right? French company Dassault. The vertical stabilizer on every Dassault airplane since the Mystery has been the same. Really? Like that same shape, like that same swoop. Like even on the Falcons and the and the their like airliners, it's got that same like like the Mirage five, the 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 Super NR, they all have that same vertical stabilizer shape. Yeah, it's kinda like um, that shark shape. Yeah. Grumman, for example, my my friend Jody likes to say there's something that she calls a resting Grumman face. <laughs> and that's like like the the, the windscreen she, like the loopy windscreen that you see on like the A6 and the o- OV1 mo- Mohawk and the S2, you know, like the F14 you know has I'm it ta- too. Talking about, yeah, like then, it's got that round plate in the middle, like that that right. Rounded and I was frame, like, yeah. okay, but how about the F14? And then she like it's immediately, and then no, she disappeared for like three minutes and came back with like a Photoshop version of an F14 that she had like connected two of the F14 single windscreens, as she was like, it's just a Cyclops. <laughs> yeah it is <laughs> like if you think about the f-14 like if you made its windscreen wide and like cover like made the bubble cover both windscreens yeah, yeah. it would still look like that <laughs> yeah yeah no they, there's a lot of continuity that goes in between like aviation and aviation like, by company and what i love about that is that it doesn't have to they are making these design choices because that's their their maker's mark that's their signature right like like that's that's to me that's artistic license um and like as, a, as an engineer like that's kind of why i enjoy working on these cold war airplanes because if i were working on like state-of-the-art like f-35s right like everyone's like talking about how the chinese and the koreans are just copying the f-35 but you know that's not true that's an efficient design that's the reason why no, every airliner since the boeing um a or sorry since the airbus a300 has looked the exact same yeah right? like every fifth generation fighter looks is gonna look like similar, that because yeah. that's what a fifth generation fighter needs to look like but if if, if that's what state of the art I, I don't see any art in that state yeah and i i like airplanes that have have energy that that have you know um personality right so yeah. um and this kind of goes into i know like I, I saw this conversation going on in your Discord about pe- people being mean to each other on their airplane opinions. <laughs> but <laughs> I I think, like, and this is to everybody who's listening, you don't need to vehemently defend your favorite airplane. And you don't, your favorite airplane does not have to be a good airplane. I'm, I'm saying this again. Your favorite airplane is allowed to be bad. Your yeah. favorite airplane is allowed to be me- mediocre. My favorite airplane is the definition of mediocrity. My favorite airplane is the Curtis P- P-40, right? P-40B specifically, right? P-40B specifically, which is even worse performing than the last P-36s. <laughs> yeah, like, um, I like the so, F-14A out of all of them, because that's the iconic A to Right. Me. Or the, that's the iconic F-14 to me. It's not, like, it's not the best, it's not even the best F-14 by far, it's the worst one, if you think about it. 
Right. But it's and the like, one I, think, I know and I love. Like, people get so caught up in this, like, I have to vehemently defend these. Like, if someone makes fun of this airplane that I like, I'm taking it personally. But I think, like, we should let our favorite airplanes exist in their truths, right? Like, like, accept them for everything that they are, for, for what they actually are. Um, and to respect that everything, like, from a, a, a Lysander to, like, a Hawker Hurricane Mark Mark II to a Blackburn Skua to I don't know why I'm only naming early war British airplanes from World War Two, but like all these things like have exist in a space and time and they're all valid right yeah so like I'm just saying you know like I'm and this goes all goes to all the A-10 fans out there like I like A-10s too you know like I I got to witness A-10s doing live gun runs and it's it it, it changed it, it was honestly a life-changing experience you know, because none of the videos, I'm telling you right now, none of the videos capture how that feels. The energy of the of the Gao-8 ripping through the air. You feel it in your eyeballs, you feel it in your chest. None of the videos can capture that, that feeling. And the videos also don't capture the way that the sound travels, which you hear the rounds crack over your head before you even hear the gun burning. You know, and it's, and it's crazy. Like, you hear the impact of the bullets, and then you hear the supersonic noise. You know, like, like it's, 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 it's whack super cool um but like every airplane warrants respect and every person warrants respect for their airplane opinions so don't hate yeah. on someone just because they like different airplanes i don't know i'm gonna get off my soapbox but i just i'm kind of tired of seeing like the aviation community be really toxic to each other just because we feel like we need to defend our favorite airplanes yeah and everybody tries to think like your favorite plane has to be the best and right. that's not the case, you know, and I, we're, we're almost at two hours here. So I think this is a good way to cap it off. But if you like airplanes and you like a specific airplane, that's enough. You don't have to fight for it. And if anybody is trying to like tell you that you shouldn't like something like what the fuck? No, just let yeah. people enjoy things. Mm hmm. Exactly. And um, like, you know, yeah, to, to bring it back, like, yeah, you know, the F5, it's, it's, it's some people's favorite airplane, you know. Yeah. But if you if you felt like you had to defend it and to say that it was the best at any one thing, <laughs> I, I I wouldn't be able to, right? Like it's yeah. a it's a cool airplane. It exists in a lot of ways. It's gonna it's always going to have um, sentimental value to me, and I'm sure to a lot of viewers out there as well. Um, but it's 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 phenomenal. It has its own place in aviation history, as every aircraft does. It you know allow your your airplane to exists in its time and its space and just just be itself right because like a lot of these myths a lot of these like bullshit stories that happen that that eventually breed into misinformation a, a lot of it might very well start from people trying to just start shit about their fa they're they're like a, a favorite airplane <laughs> yeah and like you know the f5 never was meant to be the best plane but if you are a listener right now who loves the F5 and it's your favorite plane and it's the best for you, that's enough. I respect that. Yeah. 